normal morning for someone like yourself is waking up, having breakfast, and then getting in your car and heading off for your day. For me, it's nowhere close to that easy. Thirty-five years ago, when I was 16 years old, I was on Lake Lanier. My friend and I had gone out on a boat. I was on an inner tube behind the boat. She had purposefully, as we would do with each other, is cut the boat hard to make me swing out of the side. This time, it didn't hydroplane. It actually hit a wave and threw me up into the air. When I came to, I was underwater. And going back to the dock, I continued to black out. To my advantage, her grandmother was a retired emergency room nurse, and she said there was a great chance that I had a pretty nasty concussion. The unfortunate part about it is I didn't go to the hospital. In my mind, I had to be, I'm gonna get better on my own, and I'm gonna be able to take care of this. When I was in high school, I played defensive tackle, which required me to have to hit the person across from me head to head every single play of the game. Unfortunately, my concussion was not healed. Depersonalization is a dreamlike state for your mind to be in. And this would happen right before I would tackle some people. It didn't happen all the time, but when it did happen, I knew when I got back to the huddle that I could have very easily been injured. So I went off to college, and then I started to have really bad experiences with my head. It happened on the football field finally one day. And I came into a situation where it's called fight or flight. My body was telling me to go inside. It was just weird. I just felt totally like I was in a dream. So at that point, I knew that my football career was gonna be over. I called my dad, and I said, I've gotta come home. Not one person knew exactly what was going on. I started to work, but I kept having these issues. It had gotten to a point to where I couldn't drive across the bridge. One day there was an article in the Sunday paper in the Athens Herald, and it said, don't panic, in blank letters across the top in huge font. And the article was to a T of every single thing that I had mentioned to them. I could give a name to what was going on and it was called agoraphobia. I was able to land finally a job in 1990 in healthcare. I started having more and more issues. I couldn't concentrate. I couldn't, I could not even drive from point A to point B without having seven or eight panic attacks that would almost cause me to crash my car. I would obsessively lie there in the bed and think about what I was going to have to go into the next day. Open areas, over bridges, where I was gonna park. Almost five years has passed and I've had to pretty much go through this living hell every single day. But it was unfortunate that I would end up losing my healthcare job because of the issues I would have with my panic attacks. I had to actually look at filing for disability at the age of 49, which is highly unusual. But at the same time, I had uh, been diagnosed with the anxiety disorder, panic attack disorder, depression, and the PTSD. I was doing this because I, I physically couldn't go out and, and do anything. We'll get to a certain place and we won't go in. You know, years ago we went to the um, World Congress Center and we got there apart. We couldn't walk in, we had to turn around. So we usually take the same routes because we know that those are the safe routes. He doesn't do wide open spaces at all, so it has to be back roads, neighborhoods, um, industrial parks. So it's really hard on him because he wants to do things. He just can't. And I think he has to live with it the rest of his life, and he just has to try to make do, you know, what is God's given him. I actually started to meet with a counselor and let them know exactly what was going on. I was so fortunate for her to be able to get me into the psychiatrist that I'm still with today. He has been very helpful in the progression of how I've gotten at least functional. 
But as far as how I would acclimate myself is I'll get out and I'll take a walk. And at the same time, I'm acclimating myself to go somewhere later on that day because I can't just go from waking up to jumping in a shower, to putting clothes on, jumping in a car, to driving out of the driveway. It just, my brain doesn't take that in that fast. Yes, this is even with medication. There's no magic pill out there. And a lot of people seem to think that there is, but there's not. Because I'm so far along and I've had it for so long, it's kind of like an earthquake. You have tremors first in a way of like, I can tell when it's starting to kind of onset and then I can either work my way through it or I can turn around and go back the opposite way I just came. I go into what they call a fight or flight mode, which means, I can, like I said, you can fight through it or you can fly away, turn around and go back the other way and just not go to where you were going which is failure to me. Unfortunately, with that failure comes the part of the depression. If you don't keep working with it, it'll actually make you housebound. And I've already been there, done that. See how straight this is here. This is what agoraphobia, this is where the panic attacks trigger is here. When you're looking out distance wise, and then it opens up. You have a power line easement here. We're coming into uh, a major shopping center. And what I'm thinking about right here, and I, I wanna do a little drive. Let's say, and this is kind of, yeah, this is definitely uh, anxiety and panic levels kind of getting up there a little bit what i'm trying to express is there is no way in the world that i'm going to park more than two spots back from a store that i'm going to walk into i'm very fortunate i have a very strong support group around me. i have no idea what i would do without them as a support person we don't go to places that he knows he can't walk around or park in the beginning, I was kind of like, well, what do I do? I'm, I'm sorry, can I, you know, I, I, I don't know what to do. And I would say that, but just over time, you, you read your partner, you read, you know, what exactly the situation is. And I just be there and just be present with him. Sometimes I'm, I'm there, but not touching him. He just has to go through his, his emotions by himself, you know, and as long as you're there beside him, he's, I guess he's okay. He doesn't really verbally say, oh, thanks for being here. You know, you just know. You know, living with somebody who has agoraphobia and PTSD, panic disorder, depression, it has taught me a lot how to be compassionate with other people who have other disabilities. Little does he know, I'm sure a lot of his friends probably suffer from the same thing. They're like, oh, why didn't you tell me? And we, we could have talked about it. We could have helped each other. One of the things that bothers me the most about having this disability is all the coaches and all the friends, and you have to come up with these excuses because they're not in my support group. They're a person that doesn't understand what's wrong with me. That's why I'm doing this here today, is to tell those people, this is what's wrong with me. This is why I always put it off. This is why I always said no, or I always came up with some excuse. And I'm not gonna apologize for it, but I definitely, want you to understand that in my best interest, I would have loved to have been in that car with you guys and definitely been by your side whenever any of those events were happening. You know, I had two roads I could have taken. If this never happened to me, would I have had my son? Would I have my daughter that I have now? Would I have my wife? Would I have had the life that I have now? I wouldn't trade that for anything. It's worth every bit of suffering. And if it takes years off my life because of my anxiety disorder and because of the panic attacks and because of all the stress that gets put on my body because of that, it's worth every bit of it. I would never trade it for anything.